Hi, welcome to Best in Fest, and I'm Leslie Lepage, the director of La Femme International Film Festival, and this is a podcast for people who are interested in advancing their career in television and film, and learning the dirty little secrets of Hollywood. Oh my gosh, there's so many dirty little secrets. Uh, today, I am so happy to have on a good friend, Julie Janney. She is an actor, singer, on Broadway, off Broadway, performer. Oh my gosh, what hasn't she done? She is starring in her own show, Julie Janney. Danny and friends at Rockwell Table and Stage, along with her poochie dog, Stella, and some great other friends. She has played the mom in the thriller Forget Me Not. She's also in a web series, Whole Day Down, and was Geraldine Page, played Geraldine Page in James Dean on TNT. She's toured in the U.S. and in London with Jerry Lewis. For all those listening in, oh my gosh, if you don't know who Jerry Lewis is, shame on you. So Jerry Lewis in Damn Yankees, a classic musical. She has starred in films such as Scream 3 and Music of the Heart, One True Thing, Sleepless in Seattle, Popeye, and the list goes on. She has taught dance, choreographed productions in Sacred Heart University Summer Program in Connecticut. She teaches acting at Columbia College Hollywood. She's a lifetime member of the Actors Studio and she, uh, where she still teaches Shakespeare. Oh my gosh, hello. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Are you currently doing your show in this crazy COVID environment? How, how, what is that? No, I, I'm not doing it because there's no live performances right now, but I'm, I'm actually working on another iteration of that show. And, and hopefully once that venue, that's one of my favorite kind of venues to do a, a show with music and that all that a live music show because it, it, it's it's not a concert it's just a it's more cabaret in a and Rockwell Table and Stage on Vermont is perfect for that I kind of feel like I'm in New York and it's it's fun and and it's kind of three, almost three quarter there's a bar there's food it's that's what I, I love that. So, but I'm working on another iteration of that and also just started another project, developing another project. So let's talk about that. What's that project all about? It's, I, I'm sure you read in my bio that I used to be in a girl group called the Steinettes. And, and we started when we were all in school back in New York, back in many years ago. And we started singing on the streets. And um, we sang on the streets. We had a lot of fun. We were a little retro, kind of 50s, 60s, wall of sound, girl group. We got quite a following. And then a friend introduced us to Robert Altman. And he put us in this movie, Health, which was, we had a blast and had so much fun. Not a huge Altman hit. But then, then he put us in Popeye. So anyway, this uh, group, we still get together. We were together a good six to 10 years. I mean, we performed a lot. But at the past couple of years, we've started getting together again, just for each other's birthdays, East Coast, West Coast. And one of the Steinettes lives out here. And I said, we have to do something. We have, and she sang in my show at Rockwell Table Stage, and we had a blast. And I said, we have to do something for the internet. We need to make a show. We need to make something. So it's really in the early stages of development, but it's clearly women. It's two women of a certain age. And, and it will involve music. It will also involve my dog who sings, Stella. And <laughs> right? Which is great. I, I know. I, I'm all about ensemble work. I, I prefer, <laughs> I'd rather sing ensemble with people than be in by myself. You know, I don't need... A solo here and there is fine, but I love harmony. I love working with people. I love, you know, working on the two Altman movies. Were, it was so amazing because he created such a um, such an atmosphere of ensemble work. We, we were really an ensemble. I mean, there was a script, but he also encouraged us to improv. And in that first movie we were in, he said, oh, I want you to write the music. And we were so young and silly we went oh okay we had never really written music before but we kind of had and so we ended up writing 12 songs for this movie and he shot not all of them ended up in the film but a lot of them did so you know so that's that's this next show that's that's uh, that's what we literally just started working on it developing it it's gonna be it's gonna start small 
you know, small. And honestly, Leslie, I, I listened to one of your other podcasts before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're with Rebecca, Rebecca M- Miston. Is oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, m- yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was really good. And I was kind of inspired by her listening to you talk about film festivals and stuff. And I thought, Ooh, maybe, you know, this show that we're starting to make, maybe could start as a short and then another short and then another episode and another short. So it's really just all ideas just fling, you know, flinging around right now. Well, that's what, that's what this is really all about is, you know, really looking at the hybrid model, right? The hybrid model of you as an actor, you as a writer, you as a performer. I mean, women in entertainment can't just be one thing anymore. We can't just go, oh, we're an actress. Thank you very much. That's it. You know, we have to do and become experts in many fields in order to get our performances done, our, our you know, objects done, Right. I agree. I absolutely agree. I mean, that's what, you know, I kind of look at in looking back, I think, well, I've, we've always done that. You know, we, we couldn't wait around. We made our own songs. We made our own choreography. We made our own shows. I mean, at the time back in New York, there were live shows, you know, this is before the internet. And, you know, I do remember videotaping some of our shows and actually having a big giant VHS that I would take a take around to people to show, you know, actors, especially women, like you said, Leslie, we can't wait around. There's just, it won't, you can't. And plus there's not enough, the creative juices just don't keep going. You have to keep, you know, making them going. Well, what I love is that you are this lifetime member of one of these wonderful acting studios, which I have uh, great appreciation for, the Actors uh, Studio. I studied with Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg and Milton Katselis forever. So, you know, what was that like uh, studying under, you know, some of the greats that, that came out of the Actors Studio you know, being this, this, this actor, singer, performer person. Of course, of course. Well, it all, it all meshes together. I, I too studied with Lee and, um, and I, but at the, at the same time I was studying with Lee was when I was singing on the streets with my group. And I feel like it all, it all contributed. It all went into what made me work as a, as, as a, actor, singer, dancer, all that. And, and I, and I feel like, you know, the actor studio, it was not easy to get in. No, no, no. It was not easy. It was tough. It was really tough. It was tough, but I, I just kept trying because I knew I wanted to be a member of a place where I could continue to work on my craft. That's what it became. I mean, it's interesting because I became a finalist under Lee, but then he passed away. And then I kept working and then I kind of, I moved to Connecticut and I I was still going in and out of New York, but I I joined a workshop in Connecticut called the Theater Artists Workshop of Westport. And it was there that I also was able to work on my craft and work on all the different things. And I met amazing people, like you're talking about people who had been blacklisted, you know, like uh, Ringliner Jr. and all these amazing writers and directors and I feel like I really got from every place I went that I I got support and feedback from real pros like like veterans I call them the veterans you know and then when I and then I finally got into the studio it was like oh good now I can keep working on it work on what I want to work on as far as I'm concerned we don't work enough I don't work enough yeah no one works enough yeah we all have, we all have to create our own projects to work. Exactly, exactly. And I and I, funnily enough, this past year during lockdown, the actors' studio became a real place. It it first of all, there were a lot of classes offered on Zoom with amazing teachers like Martha Gaiman and Javier Molina and all these great Sandra Seacat and and Greta Seacat and it became the first time that I really felt like the LA and New York studios were really meshed because I was working with all of them at the same time. And they actually did a festival of plays. I was in one of them. They started a play reading series on zoom around, around BIPOC issues. And yeah. And, and, 
they it was interesting because they had a writer and a director and then they picked the cast and then they would build a play a build a play for that cast like write a play for this cast so it was in a week like she the playwright wrote a seven minute play over a weekend we learned it in a week and we put it up and it was it was great. And then they they wanted to expand upon that and that the writer expanded the play to a half hour. And we did that about three months later. So it, I feel like the studio used the Zoom frame and the Zoom platform to keep creating. Well, it's interesting because you have such a wide gamut and you also teach and you also coach acting to young actors. And, and so when you are you know working as an actor yourself or when you're explaining or or trying to navigate a young actor what is the step by step process that that every actor should do when preparing for a role you know either taking it from your experience and how you educate them because i think a lot of these actors when they're going and doing shorts they don't have that preparation you know people say oh do your craft, like polish your craft, but they don't actually explain what the methodology of that craft is, you know? Right. I, I agree. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And and what's been great about teaching is I is it helped me know what I know. It helps me figure out what I know and also help me be able to explain it better. And I I, I always tell them the bottom line is say to yourself when you get a part, and sometimes it's only a page and it's it's only, what, five lines or something, but you have to make all kinds of choices. It's all about choices. And sometimes you have to make it up for yourself, but it's who am I, where am I, and what do I want? Bottom line, what do I want? Who am I, where am I, what do I want? And then coming from the background that like you're talking about, coming from the method, you know, coming, I say, you know, when you make those choices, make choices that are uh, that, that you're working on the sensorial aspect of those choices. Who am I? Where am I? Indoor, outdoor, day, night, you know, all those kind of things. And I and I tell them, you know, you have to make choices like strong choices that that engage you and make you excited about what you're doing. You know, when I when I when I got cast in Forget Me Not, that horror film you're talking about, I got a call on a Saturday from my friend Jamie Stern. And he was the co-writer and the producer and he knew me from the actor studio. And he said, I lost my actress playing the mother. Would you consider we're starting tomorrow? We're starting tomorrow. I said, send me the script right away. Send it to me. I read this. I was on my way to San Diego to see a friend perform in San Diego. I read the script in the car. I, I called him back. I said, okay, I'm in. I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow. And, and I'm down there in San Diego. I'm thinking, oh, I'm starting a film tomorrow morning. But then I thought, oh, you got this. He, he trusts you enough. You got this. So the next morning, I got to set at like 7 a.m. And he said, oh, uh, they told me, oh, we're going to, the first scene is one of the most dramatic scenes at the end of the movie like the, the that we're shooting. I went, oh, okay, okay. And then I meet the girl who's playing my daughter, cute, adorable, and, and we have a dramatic scene. I meet the guy who's playing my son. I say to him, oh, is this one of your first things? He goes, oh no, I'm on, I'm on a show. Have you heard of it? Hannah Montana. I'm on that. <laughs> I said, oh, good for you. That's fantastic. So no, I had to do a deep dive into making all kinds of choices to just boom send me in to do that scene, you know, the first thing that we shot. And, it, and I realized, you know, that's really, that takes study, that takes a lot of experience, or a lot of trust in the, the material, in your director, in your writer. And I just, just made all those choices. And boom, you just, it's high diving sometimes. But high diving can work. It can. It, it's not you. That's what. That's all you got. You know. Right. 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 Yeah. What is? What are the some some of the common mistakes y you see actors make when they're performing in films? What were your early common mistakes? You know that you might see repeated in the people that you're coaching and helping. What I find with sometimes with young actors that I'm coaching and helping there's a, a pull or a tendency to be general. Like instead of, instead of being 
bold and coming from who they are and they they kind of flatten themselves out in a way that they think is natural but what it is it's nothing you know it's 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 lack of expression i always tell them i dare to be a little too much because it's easier for a director to take you down than it is to build you up to like pump you up so i i feel like there's a a, a slide or a tendency to being like everybody else or a, a certain kind of general lack of, I don't know what it is, but it, it, I always tell them, you know, uh, play, you need to play a little more. You need to have a little more fun. You need to, I tell people, watch children, watch animals, look how they behave. It's all about behavior. So I also tell them you got to bring behavior because how you behave as this character is going to set you apart from how somebody else is going to behave as this character. Like, how does this person walk? How do they, do they, are they, do they use their hands a lot? Are they very shy? Are they, how are they physically? Like, how do they listen? You know, how do they listen? And, and it's, it's that whole sensorial thing again. How do they react to things? How do you, how do you react when somebody says something? So I, I encourage people not to, not to be homogenous. Don't try to be like everybody else. The interesting thing is with a lot of, um, you know, technology now, right? Uh, whereas before it cost a lot of money when we were shooting on 35 and, and 75 millimeter, and now we're in the digital digital realm, which allows us to shoot a lot of pages very fast, having multiple cameras on set, shooting films very efficiently. So there's a lot of filmmakers out there that are not as trained working with actors. You have been very lucky. You've worked with very, you know, top-notch, experienced directors, which can guide you and trust you uh, in that process. But I know you've also worked with uh, filmmakers that are not. So how do you work within that? How do you help guide them in your character work, in your performance? What I do is I try to make big choices and I try to, I'm thinking now of a, uh, do, I don't know if you remember the student, Matt Lynch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I did a short, I did a short for him, which was a blast. It was so fun. It was called, it was kind of a Coen Brothers uh, theme thing, Arizona Money. And, and it was a little out there. So I thought, well, I'm just going to be full out, you know, I'm going to go full out, like broad and all that. And, and he can always tell me, just take that down a little or more. He loved it. He was like, Oh, I love what you're doing. Please keep that. You could even do more. So I, I think it'd be who I, I try to make big choices and, and bring uh, my imagination, my own What's going to make this fun for me? What's going to make this character come alive for me and have fun? And then trust that if it's not true to what their vision is, they'll tell me, you know, they'll tell me. Because I've worked with famous directors who don't tell you anything. I mean, you just have to, you have to bring it, you know, bring your own self, your own creativity, imagination, expression, and behavior to everything you do. So... You know, I I think it's just trusting your own work and your own. Yeah, I was lucky in the beginning in that my first big film job and my second were with my girl group. So I was free. I was full out free. We were just being our fun selves. So I didn't, there was no, I don't remember making big acting choices. I mean, we did, especially in Popeye because we were playing real kind of cartoon characters but we already were kind of like that anyway so we, we just you know we we just i was very lucky that that's how i started in fact i had no idea robert altman shoots in sequence so the first day of shooting is the is the first page of the script and the last day of shooting was the last so those were my first two movies. When I got another movie, I'm like, wait a minute, wait, aren't we starting at the beginning? <laughs> I, had <laughs> right. no I had no idea. Yeah, he's yeah. super unusual. He follows a European style um, that is really Asian influenced, I believe, that shoot in sequence. Whereas most of Hollywood has the Hollywood style, for all those listening in, the Hollywood style is 
is based off of economics. So you're shooting the most efficient way budgetarily to shoot the film, not the best way for actors to shoot the film. And so Altman says, well, forget about the budget. I don't really care about that. I'm shooting in order to facilitate the actor and director flow, the creativity flow. And because he's Altman, you know, he can get away with it, right? Because he's an iconic director. Whereas the the rest of the world um, in Hollywood has to look at it more on a budgetary thing. So just, just that itself kind of train wrecks, you know, actors because you're shooting at a sequence. How do you really bring yourself to the roles that you are picking? Yes, you can make choices. I call them stakes, you know, choices and, and high stakes. You know, if you if I have a choice of, oh, I'm bored or, oh, my God, they're going to kill my mother. You always pick for, oh, my God, they're going to kill my mother because the stakes are higher. Right. Or what you're saying is the choice is a better choice. But how, how do you bring yourself into your role? What is your process? When I get a part or I'm offered a part, I first of all trust that whoever's asking me or casting me, I'm what they want. If that if, if I'm what they want, okay, now my job is to bring everything that I can to this part and more than is on the page. You know, that I need to bring, it's going to be my voice, my body, my experience, all my all my life experience, all my expression to this part. I mean, like we were talking about Geraldine Page. You know, Mark Rydell directed that uh, that film, and he actually cast about twenty seven actors from the actor studio in that in that film. And he gave me the part of Geraldine Page. I was so excited, and then I read the script, and I went. Oh, wow. I, I think I only had three lines on the page. So I thought, well, I, it behooves me to watch some Geraldine Page movies. And this was, this was before a lot of Internet. And, and, they, and I asked the production company and they actually copied a couple of her movies and, on VHS and gave them to me to watch, which I did. Because I wanted she had such an in, incredibly distinct vocal quality and, and cadence to her voice. And I wanted to get that. So I did. And they didn't tell me to do that, but I knew that I should do that. So you bring your research, you bring your homework. Um, but then we got to the set and I th it wasn't the first day of shooting. I think it was the second scene we shot. It was like a backstage scene. And Mark, he, Mark, right up, he, Mark said, and I was uh, dressed in, in a like period piece thing, wig, all kinds of stuff that she was in a play on a, it was a backstage at a Broadway play. And I had this dressing room and all that. And then he said, oh, um, he said to the guy playing the stage manager, you're just gonna come over to her and get, and, and you're just gonna say whatever you wanna say. This wasn't on the, so I, I just, I had done all this research. I knew who Geraldine Page was. I had seen her, I knew her in New York. So I just, I, it was an improv. You know, it was an improv coming out of the dressing room, being, all, you know, all kinds of stuff. Before an opening night, a lot is going on. I've been there, so I definitely know what that's like. And I thought to myself, oh, this will never end up in the movie. Well, it did. It, definitely, it ended up in the movie. And then another scene, it was at the after party, the opening night party. And he said, oh, just say, you're going to say something to Jimmy Dean, whatever you want to say to James Dean. So I just did, you know, but I, but that comes from, the 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 re research I had done it comes from knowing what what, op what opening night can be like. I had to bring all that to it, and I have to say, Mark Rydell was an amazing director to work with. He used to say, he used to also uh, moderate at the studio a lot, and he used to say to actors, and I stole this to say to my students. He said, "Make the bloodiest choice. Make the bloodiest choice. The, in in other words, the one that's the most dangerous, the most." The one that activates you the most. I say high stakes. So same thing, same thing. You say, say, yeah, whichever works. But I do like the bl the graphic bloodiness of it. <laughs> Make the bloodiest choice. That's awesome. So, so when you are giving a substantial role, what is like the first thing you do? What's the second thing you do? What in your laundry list? How do you attack? What's your procedure like in detail? Well, I read the script. I read the script. You know, beginning to end, and then I figure out the the arc 
of the character from the beginning. Like, what is my character's arc? This helps a lot when you're shooting out of sequence. Is figuring out figuring out the character's arc from the beginning to the end. That giant arc, because you know, in a good script, a character has a really good arc. It always, you start in one place and you end up in another. But then in each scene. I see what the arc is in each scene and how that contributes to this overall big arc. So that getting that sense of, of the journey, the character's journey. And then I have need to figure out where, what do I want? What does this character want in the whole piece? And, and what do I want in each scene? Like, what do I want is that? Who am I? Where am I? And what do I want? That what do I want is a big thing in the big arc, but then in each scene, it can change, you know, or how, or how am I going to get it? Right. It can change. So then I look at all of that. And then there are ways that I, I have in my, what I call my actor's toolkit, I have certain, certain devices or certain things I can click into that help me with uh, different aspects of different kinds of characters. You know, there may be no drinking of this character in a film, but if I want my character to be really loose and really free at a certain, in, in certain places because they're very outspoken and broad, I might use a little overall drunk sensation just because that's, that is freeing for me. Not that I've been drunk all that many times, but, you know, but it, you know, I, there are certain sensorial aspects of the character that can help me click into a character. Do you add those sensorials a a as your overall notes or do you go scene by scene and say, hey, I, I want to kind of emphasize this sensorial feeling here when it's not needed here? How, how, how do you devise that? It really depends on the, the demands of each scene and what the demands of on my character for each scene because so much is also so much is about relationships but that you can't always count on it because you know you may I've gotten parts like forget me not I met the guy who played my husband the day we started shooting I think it's just also trusting I have to say instincts too I have creative instincts play a big part in making decisions. I, I like animal work because I think it's very freeing and creative. I also like working on children. I remember once, I think I had to play somebody, I think it was much younger, but I was maybe in my 20s. And um, I had to play a, a, a challenged person who was pregnant. And I had a scene with a doctor. And I just, I just made a split decision that I was going to play her like she was nine nine years old. And that was, and that was on the spot. That wasn't even pre-prepared. It was on the spot because I don't know, everybody challenged is different and I'm not going to play challenged, but I can play a nine-year-old me. I can play a nine-year-old me. And I think it was the scene I did for the casting director. She goes, that's the most, she said to me and the doctor, the guy was very good. He said, that's the most amazing read of that scene I've ever seen. So, you know, it was a right choice, but you know, it, it, it was just a, Children and animals, I'm telling you. When you're reading the scene, do you say, oh, I want to attach an animal feeling to this? Or after reading your scene, it will come to you going, hmm, like that could lend itself to this type of animal. How does that work for you? It usually is, again, an instinctual thing. If I have to play maybe a really, really strong, kind of aggressive woman who is really going after something and just you know i might just get that image of a cougar a real like panther in my mind or something like that and that just gives my it changes my body language it changes my voice it changes the way i look at somebody it it, it gives me a whole nother persona of a, of a kind and i think that's what that kind of work can help with help me it helps me just that kind of image i have a i have a folder with images all kinds of images that I can use. And um, other teachers have also used this and suggested it. I mean, I've had really good teachers, I have to say. Do you take the folder with you to set? Do you utilize the folder when you're reading the scenes? Or do you, or is it just there for inspiration as you're flipping through after reading a script? It's just there for inspiration. It's really there for inspiration. And if I need, if I need to find a new one, I'll go, I'll go to Google Images or I'll go to Images, um, that help me, you know, I, I sometimes it funnily enough, actually images from 
films I've seen can be really helpful. And what it does is I think when you, listen, I've done this kind of work a long time. And as you know, studying with those people, you do, you do exercise after exercise after exercise and you practice and practice and practice some more. And then, and then I think that helps an actor, it helps me be able to go, oh, boom, I'm going to play this like a nine-year-old or I'm going to, and that made me speak a different way. It made my voice go up. It made me slower and made me think about my words a little more. And, you know, it, it, it just creates behavior that you, it, I think is, can be different and, and helpful. We've been talking about like the, the, the acting and the method and, and, and the procedures and, and, and how you get there and the choices, but we haven't really touched about the business of acting. What can you give us on the business of acting? I mean, I think I've been pretty good. My mother was in um, special events and publicity, so I was kind of raised in, in publicity and events, luckily enough, and she was very helpful in the early days helping me write all kinds of stuff, you know, even press releases about shows. But I I think the business is something one has to embrace. As you know, the business is, you know, marketing yourself. I mean, I, I'm still, I feel like I, one thing I like about teaching young people is I feel like I learn from them about the business. Sometimes I learn about social media from them. I learn more about, what I should be doing on social media. I'm getting better, I have to say. Like I said, I like ensemble work and I like working. So since I have my dog, Stella, which I'm gonna show you in one minute, she's sitting right here. Um, Please do. Yes, she would maybe even, she might sing. Making an Instagram page for her has been more fun than my own because it's not just about me. I mean, it's not. I'm not shy or anything, but I, I think I just get bored with my own self. It's easier for me to promote my dog and I than just me. What What's your advice to, you know, a young actor starting up? I would say uh, go to classes, study acting, study with different people, take what you what works for you from different acting teachers and coaches, take what works for you and resonates for you and, and keep going. Don't stop working on your craft. I, I think it's really important for students. I saw a great Don Cheadle, I think it was Don Cheadle. He had a great clip. Somebody asked him the same questions. And he said, how many plays have you read? How many plays have you gone to see? How many indie films have you seen lately? How many classes? Are you in class? Are you in Shakespeare class? Are you in, in technique? Are you in all this? I would say learn, study, learn, and work. You know, do different stuff. I did extra work back in New York. I learned so much. I've done, I don't know if you, what probably wasn't in my bio, but I've done eight movies with Meryl Streep as her double and her stand-in. And in each of those, over 30 years, each of those films, most, some of them I got a part, which was great, but I learned so much about in front of the camera and behind the camera in each of those movies. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. I say work, 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 work in front of the camera, work behind the camera, get, just go and meet people, keep meeting people, network 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 what is a dirty little secret that you wish somebody had told you earlier on that you've now since learned you know i think because i had a lot of success early and young i thought that would just keep happening <laughs> you know i i thought oh well i've had two movies in two years i'm gonna get one next year and next year but just keep that that you you sometimes it feels like you're you're starting from ground zero again but you're not each job that you get big or small contributes to your next job and your next job and your work it makes you better each job makes you better and it's no matter how big or small it's 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 all it goes into your experience as a working actor Excellent. Excellent. Okay. You've got to bring your poochie dog on so our people can hear and see your poochie dog. Where is she? This is Stella. <laughs> Stella, Stella by Starlight. So I interrupted her dinner. So I had to bring a piece of cheese up here with her. <laughs> Cause she's like, why are you stopping me from eating mom? It had to be you. It had to be you. I wandered around and finally found the somebody who 
Could make me be true. Oh, could make me be blue. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh! For all of you listening and going, what the heck is going on? That is her uh, dog Stella, who is singing, and she has incorporated that her into a show, a cabaret show that she was doing live before COVID. And thank you so much for the. Uh, the beautiful song from You're you welcome. and Stella. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And you and you can find her, Stella and I, at at Singing with Stella on Instagram. Awesome. Tell us the rest of your socials so we have that. Well, I'm uh, so we're at Singing with Stella. Also, I have uh, I have a YouTube page, Julie Janney, which I put a, a lot of Steinettes, a lot of Stella, a lot of me. My Instagram is JJ Jules Jam. And um, I also have all on Facebook, uh, Julie Janney and Friends for the show, but also just me, Julie Janney. So. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you guys have got to touch base with her on her Instagram. DM her on Julie Janney and Friends and Stella and uh, and listen and look at all her little uh, Instagrams. I want to say thank you so much to our wonderful guest, Julie Janney, for coming on. Uh, for those who are interested in attending the film festival this year, you can go on to lafemme.org and purchase tickets. We are uh, early birding it uh, and hope that everyone's going to come down and see a hundred plus films from wonderful female filmmakers worldwide. Uh, the podcast video can and will be posted on La Femme Film Festival YouTube channel. So tap in there if you want to see the video component. If not, uh, rate us, review us on iTunes. Thank you so much for joining us, Julie. And you've been listening to Best in Fest. Best in Fest.